Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. On February 14th, Valentine's Day, early voting begins in Sumner County. But it hasn't been a political love fest out there. The ultra-conservative Sumner County Constitutional Republicans have seized a great amount of political power in the county. Some believe that they have their sights set on absolute political dominance. This is reflected in the upcoming election and the debate over education. The WPLN News Desk sent reporters out on the beat to discover more about the SCCR and how their rise is impacting residents in the county. Blaze Ganey has been covering the political happenings in Sumner County, and he joins me now. Blaze, good to have you back, man. So you've been out in Sumner County getting a feel of the local politics. For those who may not know, tell us what's going on out there. You know, honestly, what's going on is essentially a group of Republicans joined together and thought that the Republican Party just wasn't getting things done the way that they thought they should be done. Um, And so you have this group come up called the Sumner County Constitutional Republicans. And Kurt Riley, the founder of it, actually explains it best. And he, he basically says, Democrats come over to the Republican Party so they can have an opportunity to actually run a race and win. So a lot of us were frustrated. Yeah, so you heard it right there. He, he believes essentially that the Republicans there are sort of Democrats in disguise, and hmm. so they form their own group where they vet people to make sure they have the Republican values that they want to see in office. All right, so give me a breakdown of the county. Is this a rural area? What are the racial demographics out there? Yeah, it's essentially all rural except for portions that border Davidson. Um, it's a majority white county, I think around 85 to 90 percent. And as you'd expect, there isn't much minority leadership in government. Um, in fact, I was told by the county uh, Democrat Party chair that there hasn't been a black representative in the commission for, I believe, since the 2000s. Wow, that's began. a long time. That's yeah. a really long time. Um, tell me about the income level out there. It's around 35000 for an individual, 75 k for a household. Uh, that, that's from 2021 census numbers, but I'd imagine it hasn't changed too much. So tell me, why did you want to cover the county and what's happening out there? Yeah, well, you know, I give all credit to some of the residents there who actually reached out to me on, it was either Twitter or Facebook, and brought it to my attention that a race had come down to a tie and this whole debacle over how they would settle the tie Ultimately, the Sumner County Commission ended up electing or just choosing one of the two. They chose the Republican over the Democrat and to seat them. And after that, I thought, well, this is interesting. I'll keep my eye on it. And they continued reaching out with story after story or or just ideas on what I should look into. Okay, so tell us a little bit more in your words about where the Sumner County Republicans, the Sumner County Constitutional Republicans, where they came from. I mean, I think they came from within the county. You know, they just sort of formed out of it's, it's sort of the same exact thought with um, how Trump got a lot of his people to band together. Is like they the forgotten person, essentially, or the person that just thought the government wasn't listening to their ideas. Um, enough of that. Enough of those people gathered together and formed a group that now has pretty decent numbers, not not crazy numbers, but with the lack of voter participation, the small number group they have becomes a big number mm-hmm. and they can out come out here and forcefully um, basically just sweep races. So what are their priorities? You know, putting people, this is all off their website, but putting people with a Christian foundation in office who believe in limited government, free speech, and a right to bear arms. That's what it says on their website, but As the features will show, I don't think that's their only priorities. Okay, so you mentioned the feature. We're going to get to that in a second. The SCCR, they've been incredibly successful in taking over the Sumner County Commission. Now, you know, back to 20 of the 24 commissioners they have a hold of. What has made them so successful? Yeah, I think it's just, you know, the fact that they're in a county where Republicans have won, like I said earlier, for over two decades 
that could make a voter sort of turn off, you know, make make a Democrat say, I don't even want to run. And then the Democratic residents there don't have a person to vote for. So they don't go out and vote. So then if you only have Republicans voting, some of those Republicans may start saying, well, we win every single year. Why am I wasting my time to go vote? Mm. Then you get a group of Republicans who think the Republicans that are in office, we have been voting and they haven't been doing what we want them to do. So we're going to now put forth our own candidates. And that's essentially, I believe, how this group came up. So this dominance that they have has created a little bit of voter apathy in a sense. I think it's more so the dominance that just Republicans in general have there has allowed them to come in, has allowed Republicans there to sort of say, well, we don't even need to vote. And then the ones that are not liking what's happening, the Republicans, you know, like it's just two different Republicans, essentially the constitutional Mm -hmm. Republicans. They were always voting for the Republicans, but they said, hey, they aren't constitutional enough. Okay, so talk to me about some of their methods and how they've gotten this political power. Honestly, it, it's impressive I, to, to tell the truth. I mean, they're really grassroots effort. I think they mostly are on you know social media platforms in some of these county meetings, and uh, they hold pub, their own public meetings to gather input from each other. And it's they have their own vetting process. I mean, it's essentially like a political party. Mm. Now, you you aired a feature recently. You gave us a little. Can you give us a preview of what this is about? Yeah. So basically, this is about the election commission and the county commission. There's a lawsuit between them right now. The basis of the actual lawsuit is about what building the election commission operates out of. But as you'll hear, it's more than likely a lot deeper than what's on surface. Let's listen. In 2022, state lawmakers passed a law requiring that all county election commissions use voting machines that produce paper trails for this year's presidential election. But that created another problem, where to store hundreds of machines. Federal law requires that they be kept in a secure facility. Tom Lee, the attorney on the case, says that's why the former mayor approved the relocation of the commission. And so the county mayor said, you need the space. I've got an empty building, you go there. But when the current county commission was sworn in, they attempted to reverse that action. Commissioner Mary Janong gave her reasoning. It's really not a great idea to do that. I feel it's in the interest of the citizens to keep the election department here and figure out a better way to do those things. She may have a point. Residents have gotten used to the election commission being in the administration building. But the bigger issue is, There just isn't enough space. Attorney Tom Lee believes they knew that. No one seriously believes that the election commission could store the machines in the tiny confines of the basement of the county administration building. It's not physically possible. Now, the election commission is suing the county, claiming that the commissioners have no right to reverse the relocation and they hired Lee as their attorney. But Lee believes the Constitutional Republicans' goal is bigger than just moving some voting machines around. I think this is about putting a cloud over the elections and and, and not so much the result of an election in the past or maybe even the result of an election in the future. I think the cloud in this case is intended to sit on the election commission itself. Lee's drawing this connection in part because the constitutional Republicans tend to align with those that believe the last presidential election was fixed. On their Facebook page, you can find a post that claims the U.S. justice system is rigged against former President Donald Trump. And several posts advertise a local artist illustration of Trump standing in front of an American flag, which can be bought at their scheduled meetings. County Commissioner Wes Wynn thinks the relocation efforts remind him of high school drama. It's personal vendettas. Let's just put it out there. Wynn, who isn't one of the constitutional Republicans, says they have something against Lori Ashley, the administrator of elections. They don't like her. You know, you can go back and watch finance meetings and uh, or budget meetings and interactions with her. And it, her treatment is very different than other other folks. In June, the county commission enacted a resolution that asked state lawmakers to remove Ashley from her position, accusing her of moral turpitude. The judge over the case between the two bodies scolded the county's attorney over the efforts to embarrass Ashley. But when worries, 
none of this controversy will ultimately matter because voter turnout in Sumner is abysmal. Only 14 percent of voters participated in the 2022 election. And I'll use myself as an example. I was elected with 230 some odd votes out of a pool of voters of over 5,000. Along with low voter turnout, constitutional Republicans are on Facebook posting that it's illegal to vote in a political party's primary without being a bona fide member. While that's true, it is a law, it's never been enforced, and is currently being challenged in court by the League of Women Voters of Tennessee. The League's president, Debbie Gould, says it's a tool used to create confusion. This law creates needless voter confusion, and then it will have a chilling effect on voter participation. Uh, I mean, because Tennessee does not have a voter registration system that includes party affiliations, voters do not have any way at all to know if they are a bona fide member of a political party. More than 80 percent of registered voters don't cast ballots in Sumner County. In many worry, the pending lawsuit, combined with the social media post, could make the problem worse. Wow, that is pretty wild. Now, yeah, politics aside, high school drama, that's that's what a lot of people face in our daily lives. What do you think? Oh, no, definitely. I mean, they just may not like that person. That person now has office, and that beef essentially never went away. Yeah. Okay, so this last part there talked about a law that requires people to vote only with the political party they identify with. How is that implemented? The The, the issue is it, it isn't implemented, and it's— there, it's a lawsuit right now saying it's basically impossible to implement it in a state that doesn't require voters to, you know, when they go to register to vote, they choose a political party. I mean, they don't choose a political party. I was in Florida before I came here, you know, mm-hmm. and we are required to dictate, you know, either I'm, you know, you vote Republican or you vote Democrat ahead of the election when you register to vote. So then when you go into the primaries, they they see your voter card and they give you that ballot. Here, you walk in and you just choose whichever one, depending on which candidate you want to vote for, essentially. Okay. Now, I may know the answer to this question, but is the Sumner County Commission reflective of the people of Sumner County? I mean, yes, it is. Obviously, those people live there. And it's not really for, I don't think it's for me to say or even for anybody to answer that question. I think it's more so we have to wait to see how the votes turn out. But with the low voter turnout of 14.5 percent, it's yeah. hard to know whether or not they will ever, you know, unless the voter turnout increases. Voter turnout. That's a key issue for every community in this entire country. Blaze, you're going to stick with us and be back a little bit later, right? That's right. All right. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll learn how the SCCR has impacted education in Sumner County. When we talk with WPLN reporter Alexis Marshall, we'll be right back. Funding for This Is Nashville comes from you, our listeners, and Music City Prep Clinic, Nashville-based provider for prep and offering comprehensive sexual health services in an environment designed to be safe, professional, and shame-free. Learn more at musiccityprep.org. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. This hour, we're spotlighting this week's series on the political landscape in Sumner County and how a group of people called the Sumner County Constitutional Republicans have impacted various facets of public life since winning a majority of the on the county commission in 2022. Now, before the break, we heard from political reporter Blaze Ganey about an ongoing lawsuit between the county commission and the election commission. We're going to hear now how members of the Constitutional Republicans have influenced the Sumner County School Board and about their efforts to win a majority of seats in the upcoming elections. WPLN's election reporter, education reporter, pardon me, Alexis Marshall, takes it from here. It's a Tuesday night in October of 2022. We're at a school board meeting and the room is packed. Things are tense. Oh, we have law enforcement here that can remove them if they don't want to be quiet. The board is considering banning a book about a black child navigating his feelings after a police shooting. 
17-year-old Hendersonville High School student Julia Garnett steps up to the podium. I fear that soon it will be extremely difficult for marginalized communities in all levels of education to access books with diverse and inclusive themes and values. It starts with this book, but I ask you, what's next? It's a poignant question. That specific book wasn't banned that night, but efforts to restrict books in schools have continued. So have conflicts over the director of schools and funding athletic facilities. A common denominator in all of these flashpoints is a group called the Sumner County Constitutional Republicans. Their platform is rooted in conservative Christianity. Their active Facebook page makes it clear that bipartisanship is a dirty word. And there are some long-held grievances influencing the way this group interacts with the school system today. To understand, let's go back to the fall of 2012, when schools were delayed opening for nearly two weeks. Sumner County resident Wes Dunkel explains why. Well, there was a budget impasse between the county commission refusing to fund the budget and the school district saying, well, we don't have the budget to open school. That got everybody's attention. Dunkel went on to chair a new political action committee called Strong Schools. And in 2014, they won big. We turned the county commission over to people who were pro-public education, you could say, and tired of all this baloney. One of those new commissioners was Scott Lankford, a third-generation educator at the time. My entire life as a resident of Sumner County, we were raised, we were selling cookie dough to buy copy paper. So I ran because I wanted to increase school funding. To do that, Lankford and other commissioners increased taxes to pay for new school buildings, renovations, and student resources, something that Sumner County constitutional Republicans have neither forgotten nor forgiven. Then last year, after leaving the county commission, he was appointed director of schools. In multiple Facebook posts saying that Langford can't be trusted in his new position, Constitutional Republicans remind followers of upcoming school board elections and their intentions to win a majority of seats. They've endorsed candidates in four of the six contests. If that happens... I think the very first item of business would be for them to fire our current director of schools. That's Sarah Andrews, a current school board member who's stepping down at the end of her term this year. And so you start removing those layers of people And your teachers start wondering who has their back. Langford says he's concerned about his job security, too. But he's hopeful that no matter who wins, they'll be open to working together for the benefit of students. I'll work with anybody. And I think that there are certainly people in in that group that that are willing to willing to work. But I think the group as a whole is pretty steadfastly opposed to anything we're doing as a school system. School board member Alan Lancaster was endorsed by constitutional Republicans when he ran in 2022. But he notes there are differences between the ideology promoted on the Facebook page and how he conducts himself on the board. I am representing every student, or I try the best of my ability to represent every student in our school system. Still, Lancaster says on big picture issues, he aligns with constitutional Republicans. Conservative, Christian, frugal with taxpayer dollars, and... When it gets to graphic sexual content, we're pretty adamant that that's just something that shouldn't be in a public school library. More constitutional Republicans on the school board would also likely mean more book bans. Candidates are running on protecting children from what they call inappropriate materials and the radical woke agenda. Julia Garnett, the student we heard from at the beginning of this story, has continued to speak out against book bans. As a queer student, I um, experienced a lot of like inner confusion because I didn't have representation growing up. So I always think back to that experience, and I think that's really helped me to grow to be such an advocate for fighting for the rights of students and for books to stay on the shelves because representation absolutely saves lives. Garnet has started an anti-censorship club at her high school. She'll graduate this spring and plans on studying political science in college. After that, she says she hopes to run for office one day. Alexis Marshall, WPLN News.
We are joined now by Alexis Marshall. Alexis, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Okay, so give us some background. Sumner County, it it has pretty good schools, right? Yeah, I mean, their schools are pretty highly rated on a recent school report cards from the state. Um, most schools in the district got A's or B's, and not a single one that I saw uh, had received an F. And they also have strong uh, career and technical education program. Uh, so by and large, I mean, a, a pretty darn good school system. Uh, but it wasn't always that way. Um, for decades, residents who I talked to for this body of work told me that Sumner County schools had been underfunded and that they were relying on a bunch of portables, um, that there was overcrowding and little investment and that they had to do a lot of fundraising in order to get schools up to where they needed to be. And um, then about a decade ago, there was a grassroots group called Strong Schools that kind of came in to change that. What is the Strong Schools movement? So that was a group of parents, um, nonpartisan, that got organized to support candidates in Sumner County that were committed to investing in public education. And that formed in August of 2012 after schools were delayed opening. Um, they, mm -hmm. yeah, so they basically, that got everybody's attention. Like you heard Wes say in the story, um, when schools didn't open, parents take notice. Mm -hmm. I'm sure some students would, wouldn't would mind that <laughs> school's not really opening on time, but delaying the schools, it seems like a pretty major sign of dysfunction. What was going on there? So as you heard in this story, there was this budget impasse um, where basically the county commission um, was not passing the budget that the school board said that it needed in order for its schools to function properly. Um, and they kind of got into like loggerheads over that. And it ended up taking uh, over a week of like negotiation to get schools open and to, to pass a budget so that schools could open their doors and, you know, start educating kids, start the school year. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, Tell me this. How does a school board member who has to run on an ultra conservative platform serve a diverse set of interests within the school system? You know, so I talked to um, one of the school board members who's part of this group, the Sumner County Constitutional Republicans, and, and he noted um, that there's some some nuance and some differences. He said that, you know, on big picture issues, he aligns with um, this ultra conservative group, but he also understands that he has a responsibility as somebody who's actively serving on the board that he has to work for the benefit of all students to the best of his ability. So he gave me an example that, you know, um, constitutional Republicans may be uh, very like anti- uh, undocumented immigration or illegal immigration, but he's still going to, you know, make sure that an undocumented student in Sumner County schools has just as good of an education as any other student. Um, but I mean, at the same time, there are, when you're talking about this group, like that's one member who decided to talk to me on the record. Mm -hmm. I reached out to the other constitutional Republicans on the school board and they didn't get back to me. So that's just one individual. And so I think that there's definitely some nuance. This group is not a monolith, um, but certainly the ideology is ultra conservative and, and people are having to run on a very specific platform that um, pretty much uh, exclusively includes making sure that they restrict some materials that they deem uh, inappropriate for children. Now, the constitutional Republicans and their parents may be the loudest group out there, but they can't be the only group out there. Are there other parental groups kind of trying to make their voices known? Oh, certainly. I mean, there's um, one group that comes to mind is Right to Read Sumner, uh, which is a group of parents and students who are really fighting to keep books on shelves, uh, who s say that it's a First Amendment issue, making sure that students have access to all different types of stories. Um, and I've seen them at a lot of meetings over the past year plus that I've been covering this. Um, so there's certainly uh, some diversity of opinion, but um, I, I think what makes Sumner County constitutional Republicans stand out is how organized and effective they have been at getting their folks to turn out at the polls. Now we're hearing a lot about book bans all over the country. Where does Sumner County fit into this trend? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that 
based on some of the data that I've been looking at from PEN America, which is like a free expression group, um, a free expression advocacy group, Sumner County does not stand out as one of the places that has banned the most books, um, but it has been really loud and very organized. Um, and it's been a very coordinated effort, uh, both in the schools and then also now in the public library system as a whole um, to restrict what types of uh, books uh, children have access to. So um, definitely part of a nationwide expansion in book bans. And also, I mean, we're seeing all over the place that book bans are, are moving not just from the, the schoolhouse, but also into the public libraries at large. Mm. Now, the SCCR, they've already taken over the county commission. What would it mean if they took over the school board as well? Well, I mean, it would be huge for them. You know, they, they have the majority on that county commission, and that gives them a lot of power. But um, they the county commission has passed uh, resolutions in the past to, to put pressure on the school board. But having a majority on the school board itself would give them obviously that much more power and control over what students have access to in their school libraries. Um, the county school board is who makes the final call on, uh, well, not the final call, but makes a call after a school has been banned inside of a school library. So that can be appealed to the county commission and then they get a say. Um, and it, it also means that they would get some more control over uh, the administration, like you heard in the story, um, some folks fear that the first order of business would be ousting the current director of schools, Scott Langford. So what would that mean if they completely replaced the director of schools? What would that mean for the district? Well, I mean, on a practical level, it, it does cost money. There's a, a severance clause. So if he's fired without cause, that would uh, cost the county a bit of money. Um, but then also, like Sarah Andrews was saying, um, she's worried that that could cause a larger exodus from central office. She says that Langford has a good relationship and a long established relationship with uh, school administrators and that it could also just cause sort of some some trickle down effects where teachers and more school level people start to question um, mm. who who they can trust and are could cause concerns about being like potentially micromanaged. Mm. So beyond personnel changes, what else would a takeover likely mean? Like I was saying, book bans for sure, but also something that has come up in both me and Blaze's reporting is um, just how things can turn into a battle that you might not have expected to be a battle. I remember in doing some reporting for this that there was questions over like, whether they were going to san sign a memorandum of understanding with a fire department so that one of the schools was guaranteed to have fire service if a fire broke out. Um, Sounds and, like a pretty reasonable thing. Yeah, and it wasn't going to cost any money, but there were like serious questions and like a, a significant amount of debate over like on principle whether the school board should sign this MOU, um, even though it didn't really cost money and it just turned into sort of a, a debate that um, it wasn't really clear, clear like why it was a debate. Mm. Alexis, stay right there, okay? Okay. All right. We're going to take one more short break. When we come back, we'll talk about the upcoming primary vote in Sumner County and its potential political impacts. You can join the conversation by tweeting us at This Is Nashville. We'll be right back. I'm Khalil A. Colonna, and this is Nashville. The primary election in Sumner County is on March 5th. Early voting for the primary opens up on February 14th. This election will determine what local politics are like for residents of Sumner County. Education and daily life hang in the balance. Two reporters from the WPLN News Desk, education reporter Alexis Marshall and political reporter Blaze Ganey, have been reporting as a part of a special series on the county. You can head to WPLN.org to read their stories. 
Now, let's turn our attention to the primary. For that, we're joined by both Alexis Marshall and Blaze Ganey. Thanks again to you both for being here today. Yeah, not a problem. Happy to do it. All right, so Election Day is March 5th. Early voting starts next week. Aside from school board seats, what are Sumner County residents going to be voting on? Yeah, they have um, a general sessions judge on there, also an assessor of property, and I believe it's six school board members that are up for seats that are up for grabs. Um, the Constitutional Republicans are endorsing four candidates for the school board and a judge. Okay. I think I know the answer to this, but what type of voter turnout is expected? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to know. You know, uh, we do these stories hoping that people are listening, hoping maybe people are paying attention and thinking, hey, uh, they just said voting's next week. I should get ready. I should, you know, get educated on who to vote for. But only 14% of people came out last time. And uh, County Commissioner Wes Wynn believes that could very well benefit the constitutional Republicans. The lower the voter turnout, the better it is for them. And... That's just the reality. And so you, you see actions and things that happen within our county, like, oh, we need to restrict early voting. Uh, we, we need to uh, pull back on, on voting locations. Uh, it's like, well, why would you do that? You know, why would you do that? Yeah, and I mean, I heard, uh, I saw an article just this morning that was from like a year ago where County Commissioner Jeremy Mansfield, who's an outspoken constitutional Republican, um, had said that he wanted to do away with early voting in general. Now, that's not happening this time. Mm -hmm. Early voting starts next week. Um, but that is sort of like the, the I don't know, the general direction of things, or at least the, the way that he said that he wants things to run. Are there any changes in the voting or elections process that really might impact the results? You know, I think the, I don't think there's many changes necessarily. I mean, it's a little different going in to vote now. They have different machines because of a law from before. But as far as going in to vote, I think the biggest thing is seeing a sign that tells you, um, you know, you're not supposed to vote in this political party because you may not be aligned with it all the way. Hmm. I'm interested in the low voter turnout. That seems to be a problem all across the country. We experienced it here in Nashville with the most recent mayoral election. Are there any folks out there in Sumner County really trying to drum up and draw out and get people to the polls to vote? Have you all run into anyone who's taken this as a major concern outside of the people who are involved intimately in the political apparatus? Honestly, I, I haven't run into many people that aren't directly impacted or involved in this or, or attending county commission meetings. I did talk with uh, Debbie Gould, who's the Tennessee president for League of Women Voters, and she said that she's been in communication with uh, the Henderson Hendersonville uh, person in the same group. And, you know, that that's a group that tries to get people, you know, riled up to come out, you know, and go vote. But it, it's unclear. I mean, we'll just have to really wait and see. Might be time to break out the rock the boat out the rock the vote out the mothballs and take them to Sumner County for a few uh, voting drive concerts. Now, the SCCR's takeover is still pretty new. 2022 wasn't really that long ago. How have the political changes impacted things on the ground for citizens in Sumner County? I mean, from my perspective, I've seen a lot of citizens like just see a like a sense of fear almost like I talked to one woman for a story that I did about the library system in Sumner County um, who said that it felt like there were no more conversations across the aisle and she felt like especially on local issues like you know paving roads or um, approving uh, like pretty small scale like construction projects that like people should be able to find common ground and like have civil conversations. And she felt like um, since this group had taken over the county commission, that there were fewer and fewer opportunities to have those sort of just crossing the aisle conversations and, and finding compromise. If you're just tuning in, this is Nashville and I'm your host, Khalil Colonna. We're talking this hour about politics in Sumner County with WPLN reporters Alexis Marshall and Blaze Ganey. So is there much pushback? to the SCCR from Democrats or even moderate Republicans? Yes, <laughs> I, w I would say so. Um, not that there's a whole lot of um, power there right now. I don't know that they're, that they're able to push back um, from a position of power, but there there is 
pushback, certainly. And I mean, to be fair, um, you know, the the school board, for example, um, they don't have a majority there. So th- they have still been able to um, sort of push back on some of the agenda of Sumner County constitutional Republicans. Um, but I think that in general, uh, not a whole lot of power to push back on the county commission side of things. Yeah, I think um, County Commissioner Wes Wynn and some of the others who are not on the commission but not necessarily aligned with that group are very outspoken. They they know they're in the minority, essentially, and they use their time to sort of ask a lot of questions during meetings to point out maybe, you know, things that they believe may be an issue. And, and I, I believe to sort of get the answer out to the public of mm-hmm. what is truly the reasoning. Have you seen any organizing, any signs of organizing from Democrats or anyone? I mean, I have. I've seen folks, you know, um, endorsing candidates that are going to be in direct competition against Sumner County constitutional Republicans. Um, I've seen, you know, folks deciding to run for school board to compete in these races. Um, And it just sort of remains to be seen how effective they'll be. Do you think they have any chance against the supermajority? I don't know. I guess we're just going to have to wait for voters. Yep. I, I don't want to. I don't want to try to read the tea leaves. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't try to read them either. But I do think they have a chance with the fact that there's such low voter turnout. Mm. I mean, if you can get a high school gy- gymnasium full of people to go and vote for you, you could win. Uh, I'm just curious about what uh, a real solid organization effort would be, look like because it it seems to me like the SCCR is highly organized. They're functioning, as you said, Blaze, kind of as a pack. They've been at this for a while, and we've seen how they how they've been able to grow their political power. Would could there potentially be opposing political forces who take a page out of their playbook and decide to organize in an equal fashion? I mean, I, I think that's exactly what you will see. Um, you know, coming up either now or next county commission race. They, their people eventually will get upset enough with how things are going and form a group of their own, even if it's just simply the Republican group. But, you know, they will form a group of their own to try and say, hey, this is enough. Enough is enough. We need to cut it out. How does I'm sorry, Alexis. Oh, I mean, I was just going to say that the strong schools group that we saw crop up after 2012 when the school year was delayed. I mean, that was sort of a grassroots group of parents who had sort of a single issue that was really motivating to them. Um, So I would say it's probably not outside the realm of possibility that another group like that or maybe even a resurrection of that group um, could decide to to organize and, and try to oppose this group. But Again, we'll just have to wait and see whether that happens. Mm. Now, tell me this. How does this compare to what we're seeing in other Tennessee counties? On the education and book banning and library stuff, I mean, it really falls in with sort of a a trend. Um, In the Tennessee legislature, there's a bill right now that would allow a really small minority of people to petition to ban library books at the public libraries. So again, extending outside of the schoolhouse and getting into what the public at large has access to. Um, And and that would allow 2% of the people who voted in the most recent gubernatorial election. So in a lot of places, you already have this really low voter turnout. Mm -hmm. And then only 2% of that would be needed to petition the library to remove books that have content that they deem is harmful to children. Wow. Okay. Now, you both did some really great features on Sumner County this week. Commend you for that. But tell me this. Is there anything that you wanted to include in the features that had to hit the cutting room floor, as we say here in the building? I mean, I think some of the bites that we played um, during this this segment here, and I think most of the stuff that I really wanted to include was just not available because a, a large portion of the Sumner County Constitutional Republican groups did not either respond to emails, phone calls, or, you know, in talking with them, they just declined to do an interview. Mm. Alexis? I mean, there were hours and hours of tape and interviews and meetings that I reviewed in order to, like, put together sort of the pieces of this puzzle that lead to the the bigger picture. Um, 
But I, I think one sort of instance that I didn't get to include that I thought was really interesting was about a year ago when um, we had a really similar situation to Blaze's first story where there was a, a an undetermined race. And in his case, it was a tie for a county commission seat. In my case, a school board member had died last year and there was a vacancy where people could apply to um, to fill that position. And the runner up in that school board race applied to fill it. So did a moderate Republican. And so did somebody who had run as a, a, a third party write in uh, who was part of constitutional Republicans. And he's the one who they ended up choosing to fill that vacancy. So it's just sort of a trend, you know, just choosing somebody of their own mind to to fill in a seat that, um, you know, another candidate had actually won more votes in the general election for. Mm, you know, I actually want to chime in and say another thing that was interesting was the bleacher at the school. It was it was just this whole debacle about the school needed new bleachers. The bleachers were worn and torn and needed to be removed. And it took months for them to just approve the finances. All the board was, all the commission was supposed to do was say yes or no, you can use this money for that. And they came back and said, well, why did you let it get, you know, so down and, um, and not take care of it better? Mm. And, and it just became this long thing that was really drawn out. I had some sound on that issue that just couldn't make it. Another lawsuit where they're trying to give this uh, property away. Um, it, it's so much going on that just couldn't make it to the final now, version. I, I understand that the SCCR has something on their social media called the Wall of the Unaccountable. What um, is that? Well, that was on their website, but uh, if you go and look it up right now, uh, I don't think it's there anymore. Hmm. I, I think it has been taken down since uh, Blaze's story mentioning it aired on Monday. So what was that? Blaise, yeah, I, I'll describe like it. Explain? So so essentially it's like if you can imagine having a Facebook and you can have like your eight close friends, uh -huh. it was the eight most hated people in the county. Wow. Or But it was more than eight. It was w way over eight. In fact, uh, Commissioner West Wynn was the first face that you see on there. It says fraudster right next to his name. It accuses him of running a, another website that is like their fake website that shows a picture of Jeremy Mansfield with a white nationalist organization. The, I believe the picture is real, but anyways, they're saying the website is not real. That's not them. Mm. Um, and then it just has uh, some school board members on there, some aldermen in, this, in the city, I believe. Um, I don't know if the former mayor is on there, but there's a lot of people on, on that list. It, it, it runs really long. Yeah, I think it was like every school board member that was not endorsed by Sumner County Constitutional Republicans, um, the current school board director, or not school board director, the, the current director of schools, Scott Langford, was on the wall of the unaccountable. It was it was a lot of public officials and, frankly, just folks that are not endorsed by them. Mm. Now, you both have been speaking to people who live in Sumner County. Did you talk to any folks who don't hold positions of power, like regular folks? Oh, yeah. I mean, I talked to a former library system employee, talked to a student, talked to um, some folks who, I, I mean, Wes Dunkel, he was a former PAC chair, but um, doesn't hold public office. Talked to a lot of just like regular residents about how this has impacted their lives. How are they how are they really feeling about the political climate out there? I mean, if somebody is interested in their community trying to get things done, interested in their county government working well, interested in the schools providing the education that people are sending their kids there for, but there seems to be for lack of a better word a lot of political mess going on. How are they really feeling? What are their honest opinions? I mean, a lot of the reason why you don't hear them in the stories because they didn't want to go on record. <laughs> you know, they, they, they have very strong opinions, I'll say that, about the way that things are going. And they believe, I don't know if it was out of fear that they didn't want to talk, but or ongoing lawsuits, you know, all sorts of reasons that they didn't want to actually talk about it. But there are a lot of people there um, that are not elected that are doing essentially what they feel like is everything they can to try to prevent some of the uh, overstepping that the commission is doing. Mm. Yeah, I talked to folks who were just scared and also sad about how contentious local issues have become. Because if you think about it, like 
local government is often a place where folks from different sides of the ideological spectrum can find common ground because it's taking care of, you know, smaller things. It doesn't all have to be like this big, um, like national level issues where where things do get a little bit more contentious and more heated um, and, and sort of just a, a sense of sadness that this is how things have turned out recently and also you know fear of reprisal fear of threats mm. i mean another thing that i didn't get to put into this story um about uh libraries uh, if if folks go to the website and listen to the library story um a former library director in hendersonville ended up uh getting fired after an event that was um i, I would say very closely aligned with sumner county constitutional republicans and that library, like, later received a bomb threat. Mm. Um, so so there is a, definitely a sense of fear among some residents that going publicly against this group um, can come with some really negative consequences. Things have been politically tense for a while in our country, and particularly since the pandemic, the 2020 election. We've got the 2024 election coming up later this fall. How do you feel all of these events currently, right now, happening in Sumner County? How do you feel like the... 2024 general election is influencing those actions by people. Yeah, I think I think very much so as as we sit here on TV and you can see that the justice questions suggest uh, support for Trump and ballot dispute. I mean, I, I, if I go to their Facebook, I'd imagine that this is also posted on their Facebook. Um, and I think many people there look at the national issues. I believe that the issue that happened at the library where that person was later on fired was really a national issue that became local, localized. And uh, apparently that's a lot of what is taking place here. Uh, a lot of these book banning things come from other places where they see, oh, that place banned this book. We should just do it here. They may not even actually have read the book or may not even know if the book exists in their libraries, but they want to ban it and make sure that it never does. Yeah, I think those culture war issues um, are really a, a driving force. And I, I mean, to some folks who are part of this group, it, it maybe it doesn't feel like a culture war. It feels like, you know, a really urgent, um, like existential issue. Like people who agree with this group have come to public meetings and like very earnestly said things like, I don't want my child like seeing porn at their school library and seem very you know, earnestly and honestly concerned about that. Um, but I do think that it's part of this national conversation where that's sort of the rhetoric that's going on, that there's indoctrination happening and they want to stop it. Besides the election results, what else are you guys looking out for? Well, I'm looking at, so the uh, there's been a complaint filed with the state that would make this group register as a political action committee. Mm. I think how that turns out could be very interesting because it could make other future grassroots campaigns um, have to register before they, you know, start endorsing candidates or, you know, doing other things like that. Mm -hmm. Alexis? I'll also be looking at voter turnout in this election. I think that that's going to be really interesting. Um, you know, I'm going to be looking at voter turnout all across Tennessee. So much has happened since 2022, and it makes you wonder um, whether people are interested in getting more organized and, and turning out the vote more. So that's sort of what I'll keep be, be keeping my eye on. And then obviously the results of that school board election are going to be really interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. Okay, last question. Each community is and, and county, is very, they're very different from each other. I'm curious about what type of indicator do the activities in Sumner County, what they present when you're thinking about the rest of the state? Mm -hmm. Well, I know that in Sumner, we're, we're seeing this expansion of book banning into the public library at large. That's also happening in Rutherford County, and I would venture to guess other places as well. Um, and then the the possible effort to oust the the director of schools, we've seen that happen across the country in South Carolina and Florida and California. Um, so this is really a loud example and a very visible example of a group that's organized and working toward its ends, but it is certainly not isolated and something that we're seeing all over the place. Yeah, I think exactly what Alexis said. This is just closer to home, so it's easier to keep an eye on it. 
Well, you both are powerhouses and examples why WPLN, the newsroom here, is one of the best. Alexis Marshall covers education for WPLN, and Blaze Gaini is the political reporter. They've both been covering Sumner County for a special series. You can read their work by heading to WPLN.org. Alexis and Blaze, thanks for all of your hard work, and thanks for your reporting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to you for tuning in this hour. This is Nashville as a production of Nashville Public Radio. Today's episode was produced by Magnolia McKay. It was directed by our senior producer, Tasha A.F. Limley. Our board operator and technical director is Liv Lombardi. The masterminds behind our theme music are LaRange and Namir Blade. You can listen back at thisisnashville.org or wherever you get your podcasts. And the conversation doesn't end here. Tweet us at This Is Nashville. Find us on Instagram and tell us what you want from our show by filling out our quick survey online. This is Nashville. I'm Khalil A. Kaluna. We'll see you Monday, everybody. And be good to each other.